to order. Uh, first order of business is the minutes. Um, let's do the three, March 9th, 2015 first. Um, do I see any corrections or comments? So, I, Christine? I have uh, um, several on the public works budgets. Okay. Starting with uh, maintenance of town fields. Yep. Um, the second sentence that says the increase is to be better balance this expense with recreation, which pays $40,000. Uh, I don't think recreation pays 40000 The increase um, was to uh, better reduce um, the DPW's relia increasing reliance on the, recreations, the recreation department's user fees. Which come out of revolving fund and not out of recreation budget. Right. Right. And I don't think we voted 50000 for that whole budget, did we? We did vote 50000 Okay, that was right. Okay. Yeah, we did. So what do you want instead of pays? Um, I think it should read the increases to um, uh, help reduce the DPW's increasing reliance on the Recreation um, Department Revolving Fund. Will do. Thank you. Um, and then the next correction is in administration. Uh, the second sentence, <coughs> um, you refer to the maintenance department. I think we should refer to it as the facilities department. Okay, so it's facilities, not maintenance. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, the next one is snow and ice. Uh, the the third line um, of this year's total cost, I would write approximately 200000 was spent hauling snow and ice. I didn't get that. I, um, it's approximately two hundred, not... Oh, approximately. And on the next page, um, <coughs> highway motor equipment repair. The third line, uh, I think it's, uh, it would better read uh, the maintenance line item is less than recent years actual actuals because the director hopes, instead expects, hopes to reduce costs with efficiencies. Hopes rather than expects. Right. Sounds like wild point to me. Okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, in, in solid waste, um, I don't. The dis the disposal cost what didn't decrease because of market pressure on the North Andrew operator. I would I would say that disposal cost is decreased in accordance with the terms of the contract. Got it. And my last correction is the. Amount voted for solid waste, I think, is three million four hundred ten thousand and forty-eight dollars instead of forty-three. I have trouble with three. <laughs> as long as they're with the dollar parts, not the million parts, <laughs> they're fine. Three percent, and that's it. Okay, are there any other corrections? Okay, Peter, I have one question. I'm not sure. The uh, like fourth line up reserve fund voted a million dollars. Oh, voted the budget a million dollars. Sorry. Okay. Okay, are there any other questions? No. Comments? Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Okay, moved and seconded for accept the minutes is corrected. Any other <coughs> discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, okay, the minutes from the 11th. Do I have any corrections? Uh, yes. Just on the veteran services, where you have it also reimburses 100% for flags on graves. Did you also add the... Uh, 100% um, for um, emergency housing assistance. Flags on grades and what? Emergency housing assistance. Oh, emergency housing. Thank you. 
Okay. And wasn't the amount 155,000 instead of 115? Yes, that's wrong. That should be 155. Okay. Thank you. And you need to correct it on the reserve fund on the back? Yes, that's right. Okay, are there any other corrections on these minutes? Yes, 155. Okay, do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor of accepting the minutes for uh, March 11th as corrected, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Done. Okay, um, <coughs> why don't we move right into the capital plan? So I've, we've got five seats up here, seven people. Okay, that'll give me another one. No problem, I'll try to be flexible. <laughs> instead of throwing them. <laughs> um, so first of all, uh, the, let me introduce the people that are here on my right, uh, Diane Johnson, and then to her right, Barbara Thornton. Diane, as you know, is the CFO of the um, school district, of, of the Arlington School System. And Barbara has, uh, has been on the Capital Planning Committee for a long time, and is very, uh, very active in the committee. And as you know from the other night, she's also a principal mover in the, in the facilities department, uh, having been on the maintenance committee for the last couple of years. To my immediate left, I think we all know Andrew Flanagan, <coughs> who uh, actually has turned out to be the workhorse of the Capital Planning Committee, and I have to tip my hat and thank him for the great work that he and his department do. Um, over in the far corner, uh, Tony Lionetta, who is our um, engineering techie, and uh, whenever we get into something that's over our head, we give it to Tony, and he sort of fleshes it out. And then uh, Michael Morse is the deputy town treasurer who started this year uh, and has been doing yeoman work on the committee. And then uh, Brian Rarig, our vice chairman, is, uh, uh, does, does a lot of things, including uh, keeping Andrew and I uh, accurate, which is uh, sometimes difficult. So um, thank you very much for having us tonight. I uh, also want to mention there are two members that are not with us uh, tonight, uh, Ruth Lewis and um, Steve Andrew. I think they're both in Florida, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ruth is at accounting school, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so the list of uh, all, all the people on the committee is on page four in your booklet. And on page uh, five, there's an organizational chart uh, we've taken a cue from the Finance Committee, and what we do is try to split the work up among various subcommittees that tend to work in the subcommittees for a long period of time so we get a certain amount of institutional knowledge. And then you see the uh, department um, uh, responsibilities for each of the subcommittees below those uh, yellow blocks. And please, if you have any questions about any of this, please feel free to ask. Now, some of you, uh, I'm going to just run through a couple of slides here. Some of you have heard this before, but it's always good to have a little refresher course. Um, and <coughs> for those, uh, did you say you take questions on now? Well, sure. <coughs> who, who handles the clerk on the assessment, especially the clerk? <coughs> uh, actually, um, I don't know. Do you know him? <coughs> they haven't had a, um, well, never, so neither time had a capital request. request. Never seen a cap, well, we do get capital requests for, for the assessors like 20 years ago we had one, but not since then. So, um, that's a good question, but we, we haven't had any requests. Thanks. So, um, the, um, I guess the, 
what, what we what I'll sort of discuss from an overview here tonight is is why we do capital planning and how our <coughs> how our capital planning process works, and uh, what what our guidelines are and what our objectives are. And on page seven, there's four or five bullets there that basically sort of describe why we do capital planning. And in, in a in a couple of words, it really is because um, the the management of the town and, and the people who work in the different departments in the town, they need to have some um, uh, s some s stability and, and, and regularity and, and confidence in, in the tools that they're going to have to use uh, in their jobs. And a lot of times the, the acquisitions the Capital Planning Committee recommends are big ticket items and they can't be made easily and a lot of times these folks have to wait for their projects or wait for their equipment. But the, the planning process uh, creates a consistent way of addressing these and eliminates uncertainty. If they, if they, if usually, at least it's been the practice, if if the uh, if a request uh, gets supported by the capital planning committee, and they bring it to town meeting and the capital plan, sooner or later that department will get its its funding for the project that it, they're looking to accomplish. So that sort of um, that sort of stability and and. Um, uh, elimination of uncertainty is really the objective of the Capital Planning Committee. Uh, we also uh, spend a lot of time trying to make sure that the requests are valid and the money is right and it's going to be used well, et cetera. But it's really a powerful tool for, for the management and the uh, workers in the town to get the things they need to get their job done. Um, we have a five-year planning process, and I think most of you know this. Um, and the, it, we have, we'll, we'll be talking tonight about the budget for fiscal year 16, which is next year, and then four years of planning beyond that. So we're looking at a five-year planning process. We, we'll talk about exempt and non-exempt spending. Uh, exempt spending is, ex is spending that's beyond the limits of Proposition 2.5, normally approved by an override or a debt exclusion or some other referendum um, of, the, of the voters, similar to the uh, uh, Community Preservation Act last year. And uh, non-exempt spending is spending that's within the limits of Proposition 2.5, under which our town budget can only grow year by year, 2.5% plus, uh, with, with, uh, plus new growth. Um, we try to forecast uh, the future budgets, uh, or actually it's become a lot easier lately because we work with the Long Range Planning Committee and adopt their, their forecast. Uh, and we, we plan within the five-year five year horizon of the Long Range Planning Committee. We have about uh, 29 years of successful capital planning within budget. In other words, um, and we'll talk about what I mean by within budget, but we've been doing this for a fairly long time and it works pretty well. Um, the requests that this town and the school make for capital projects, um, you know, always there's always pressure between capital and operating, and, the, and, the, and so the both the town side and the school side have learned how to how to <coughs> operate within those constraints. The about um, I'll say more, more than 20 years ago, I think, uh, might have been pr prior to when um, uh, might have been when Bob O'Neill was chairman. I'm not sure, but um, the finance committee <coughs> advised the capital planning committee that we should try to maintain capital spending, including debt service and direct purchases, um, to within. 5% of the revenue of the, of the uh, town's non-exempt budget. And so that's, that's where we have uh, always targeted to wind up. And you'll see as we go through this that, that's, that indeed that's what, what we've done in the past and that's what we're planning to do in the future. So uh, with this background, I'd like to uh, just turn it over to Andrew who's going to give us a little bit of an update on some of the programs that, we've been, that have been approved by the Finance Committee and Town Meeting in the past. And, um, and you know, those that have been completed and some of them that are in progress. So Andrew? Thank you, Charlie. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is uh, begin by talking about uh, some of the projects that we finalized since we last met uh, this time last year, uh, and then an overview of some of the projects that are in process, and uh, I'll go into uh, varying uh, degrees of detail based on what is going to be covered later in the uh, presentation by uh, my colleagues on the committee. Um, so uh, the big the big uh, project that was completed um, most recently was phase two of the uh, community safety building, uh, which we're all sitting in tonight. As you may recall, phase one uh, focused mainly on uh, the terrace. Phase two was um, sealing the envelope of the building. Uh, Brian will go into much more detail about this. Uh, it was a project that I certainly had challenges 
um, and thanks to the hard work of uh, the Permit Town Building Committee, the town manager, uh, and a lot of various people, not, not uh, to forget the people who have actually occupied the building uh, for the past uh, almost two years of the project, uh, they certainly uh, withstood uh, some challenges. Um, we're pleased to report that uh, the building is uh, watertight um, and um, planning for phase three is underway. Uh, moving on, uh, the Ar Ar Arlington Redevelopment Board has uh, endorsed uh, the master plan. Uh, I know many people in this room are uh, part of that process. Uh, the capital and plan over the course of two years uh, invested um, just about $150,000 into that effort, <coughs> uh, in addition to uh, some funds uh, that were provided <coughs> through the uh, CDBG program. Um, I think it's something we're going to hear a lot about. I know you've already heard a lot about, and you're going to hear more about as we lead up to town meeting. Um, but I wanted to mention um, the capital uh, budget's contribution to that effort. Uh, various roadways and sidewalks, um, we continue to maintain a pretty aggressive program. Uh, with regard to roadways, we continue the budget $500,000 um, in Chapter 90 funds. Um, the governor has released more than uh, they had, the new governor, I should say, has released more than uh, we've seen in the past couple of years, so we hope to be able to do a little bit uh, more work and access to that. You'll see that if you're looking for it in the other category and how we define the uh, uh, funding sources because it's a fund we receive from the state. Um, in terms of cash capital outlay, cash capital, uh, we continue the program, $350,000 in cash for roadway programs um, in each year of the plan. Uh, and then lastly, uh, with regard to the current fiscal year, uh, we programmed just about $420,000 um, from override funds from the uh, 2012 override. Uh, we increased that amount by 2.5% each year. Uh, I project to continue to do so uh, in the future. Um, with regard to uh, sidewalks and um, uh, accessibility, uh, we continue uh, to make significant investments um, in the installation of compliant uh, sidewalk ramps. Uh, what you'll see again in the other category is $125,000 in CDBG funds, um, and then another $50,000 for sidewalk improvements, and another $65,000 um, to uh, go towards the, the, the ramp program. Uh, when we began this effort, uh, we had almost 1,000 ramps to do, uh, and at uh, this rate, we continue to make pro progress. Um, ongoing uh, water and sewer improvements. Uh, the town has continued to take advantage, when possible, of the MWRA Zero Interest Loan Program uh, and some of the grant programs uh, they had available. So at last year's town meeting, um, town meeting authorized the town to borrow $800,000 for uh, improvements to uh, sewer mains and facilities and $750,000 uh, in water. Uh, that's in addition to um, um, cash capital uh, line items in the water and sewer budget. Um, that uh, contribute to this effort too, including the hydro replacement program and whatnot. But uh, when you combine water and so together, you're just about $2 million worth of investment on an annual basis. Um, uh, the, we've completed the design uh, and uh, the construction of both New North Union Spray Park and Hibbert uh, Playground. As you know, North Union is a spray park uh, that's adjacent to the Thompson School, very popular. Uh, um, we're uh, pleased to be able to report that we um, we actually went out to bid uh, for both projects together and we were able to do both uh, under budget. Um, so that's uh, what we have completed. Now I'll get into uh, what's in progress. Um, we're in the final, uh, final stages of the central fire station renovation. Um, if you drive by, you <coughs> will see it's still fenced in, but I think over the next three to four months, uh, you're going to start seeing a big difference uh, from the outside looking in. Uh, they've made a lot of progress. The project's still uh, on budget. Again, Brian will go into much more detail about this, uh, but everybody's slated to, uh, to return to the building, including uh, the, the shifts that are assigned to Central Fire, but also um, the administration functions of the fire department, so uh, the Office of the Fire Chief, uh, fire prevention, training, and EMS management, uh, all uh, expect to return uh, to the building, not return to the building, but go to the building on July 1. Um, Again, ongoing water and sewer improvements. Uh, I've talked about those. Um, one thing as you get into the water and sewer budget, just as a, a FYI, one thing I tried to do this year was break out a uh, new operating budget, the MWRA loan program, in terms of the debt service associated with that, and the non-MWRA loan program, so you can kind of see uh, as a total how, how the two of those amount to. Um, various public works rolling stock, uh, Director Rademacher, uh, uh, continues to adhere to his um, plan for replacing fleet. 
Um, that's ongoing. In addition to public works, uh, we replaced $131,000 in uh, police vehicles. Um, nothing was programmed this year in terms of uh, fire vehicles. Um, we're just about to wrap up, um, and I think you'll see an announcement regarding a public meeting on the planning phase of the Comprehensive Gateway Initiative. Um, this is probably the most significant investment in the gateways, uh, almost each gateway, all nine of them into the town of Arlington uh, that we've seen. It's going to include improvements to signage, landscape, hardscape. Uh, we've contracted with a uh, landscape architect out of Lexington uh, who's done some great work in uh, designing some concepts for us. And I think some areas in which uh, have long maybe considered blight or blighted when you uh, enter the town, uh, you'll see big improvements too. Um, uh, the design phase of uh, <coughs> uh, phase three of the community safety building project uh, is underway. Um, project will be putting out a uh, bid shortly. Um, the planning phase of the townwide voice over IP uh, phone project is also uh, underway. The town contracted with a consultant uh, to basically define uh, what our requirements were in terms of the townwide school and town, that is, um, investment in moving to a, a voice over IP system. So a lot of one question we get a lot is all the new buildings, uh, they may be completed faster than we get the phones installed. Everything including the Thompson, the Central, this building, everything will be wired for voice over IP. Uh, so basically we just have to plug in. Uh, we hope to get that rolling in terms of out to bid uh, in the next several months. Um, and then lastly, um, we completed design uh, and are pre preparing to begin um, construction of uh, the Spy Pond Tennis Course. Uh, that's a quick overview of uh, what's in progress. Again, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, just, uh, I, excuse me, but I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, Laura Chesson, who is the uh, uh, deputy superintendent of schools, is here to support the uh, capital planning committee tonight in case we need help. And want to, want to thank her uh, for coming and acknowledge her being here. Thank you, Laura. Uh, uh, on to slide 10, uh, reconciliation to the uh, town five-year plan. Um, so this is how we back into what we often refer to on the committee as the non-exempt plan. So, so the non-exempt budget, I should say. So the non-exempt budget, that's the amount in which we take 5% of uh, in uh, uh, budget, the uh, capital budget and capital plan. So if you see total town budget um, on the top line, uh, that's the budget uh, number for FY16 through 20 that you uh, saw in your uh, budget book that was submitted by the town manager on uh, January 15th. From that, we reduce uh, things that are generally considered exempt uh, outside the limitations of two and a half in regards to uh, service delivery. So we back out to the MWA debt shift. Um, I think everybody's familiar with that at uh, uh, 5.5 5 million, almost 5.6. Um, we also uh, back out any exempt debt service, so that $2.6 million number you see for 16 is reflective of the current uh, debt associated with debt exclusions uh, for our school buildings. Uh, nothing in that line um, includes SIMS debt. Uh, and then lastly, uh, adjust for enterprise funds. So those are the offsets um, or other charges we make to other town funds. Um, so basically, we don't take advantage of charging 5% uh, against those. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a result, reduced to what we call the adjusted total town budget or the non-exempt budget, uh, or I think what you see on the next slide is the pro forma budget. Yeah. Let me add, uh, there's a note there that says that as of uh, January 15th, um, the, these budgets, uh, including the five long-range projections, change depend depending upon what the, uh, the governor and the House and the Senate decide to do about local aid. So these, these numbers can change a little bit and probably will change before we actually <coughs> bring this to uh, to uh, town meeting and we'll write up the capital report. But substantively, um, this is what it is. So um, moving on to slide 11, uh, this is the five-year uh, plan in FinCon, uh, in conformance with FinCon guidelines. Uh, this is the way we uh, arrive at our 5% and really serves as the financing for the five-year plan. Uh, and what I'll do is uh, I'll just walk line through line. There's a couple new ones uh, this year. Um, and I'll explain them uh, as we go. So the first line is a uh, prior non-exempt debt. So that is all debt uh, that is funded within the uh, limitations of Proposition 2.5. That's all current debt that is owed on the books. Um, as you see, that gradually declines year over year uh, as it is uh, amortized. Um, the line before that, uh, after that, excuse me, uh, is cash capital outlay. So those are things that, uh, the, the cash uh, capital uh, funds things that doesn't make sense 
are not able to be funded under general law uh, through debt service. Um, so there's a lot of vehicle replacement there, um, studies that the committee funds, uh, roadway improvements. <coughs> Um, and then you see a new non-exempt debt service. So again, that is within the limitations of two and a half. <coughs> and uh, that is what we anticipate being the debt service associated with the projects approved and funded in FY16. And as you see the prior non-exempt decrease, you see the new debt increase. And it comes uh, pretty close to uh, level service. Um, then we arrive at what we uh, refer to as the total non-exempt tax burden. So that's the total of everything that's funded within uh, the limitations of two and a half. From here, we begin applying uh, different offsets or adjustments, um, some cash, some non-cash, um, and I'll explain them as we go. The, be the first being uh, adjust for Brink Enterprise Fund. Uh, you'll see that amount be uh, 83 fixed at $83,000 uh, through FY20. Um, that's the plan right now. Um, there's a whole slide on this a little bit later uh, that I'll uh, go into more detail on. But the $83,000 basically accounts for uh, just about 52% of the debt associated with investments in the Ed Burns Arena. <coughs> um, from there, uh, you'll see adjust for ambulance revolving, um, revenues uh, from ambulance service, some are deposited to the general fund, other are deposited to the revolving fund. Um, we charge the revolving fund for debt service associated with uh, the purchase of ambulances. Uh, the town owns two, um, depending on staff strength, we run one or two. Um, so you'll see that amount uh, in each year of the plan. Uh, the next is uh, our first uh, non-cash offset, and that's adjust for roadway reconstructions over I-2011. Um, so this is an amount that increases 2.5% each year of the plan, um, and it's uh, one of the commitments of the most recent override in 2012, which was to uh, put aside $400,000 for roadway uh, improvements. It's a commitment of the override. Uh, we pay for it in full in the non-exempt plan, um, but then we don't basically penalize the capital budget and it's 5% uh, by offsetting it by the amount uh, that we invest. Um, the next uh, line is uh, capital carry forward. So that is uh, um, existing capital balances, so projects that have come in under budget. Uh, there's balances left over. Uh, what we're able to do um, is uh, basically collapse them into one line and uh, offset the bottom line. <coughs> um, antenna funds, so uh, town antenna funds, so that's revenue. Um, the town receives 100% of revenue associated with uh, contracted agreements for uh, the installation uh, of antennas on town buildings. But the way gen uh, Mass General Law also works, and let's say the MWA water tower, the town uh, has a right to 50% of the revenue because the water tower is within the boundaries of uh, the town of Arlington. Um, so basically, those two sources. Uh, put money into our antenna fund, they go directly into the antenna fund. Uh, and when the fund was established, it was agreed upon um, that those funds would be used to offset um, capital costs associated with investments in uh, recreation facilities. So we've programmed $326,000 for FY16. Um, I can tell you that the actual investment um, with regard to debt service for uh, parks and fields and <coughs> lands uh, is closer to $500,000. So. Um, a very large portion of it is being offset by tenant funds this year. Um, the next line is uh, one of uh, the new lines, Urban Renewal Fund, uh, Central School, Jefferson Cutter, 23 Maple Street. Um, so uh, the Urban Renewal uh, Plan was established sometime around 1984, um, and since that time a lot of the capital investments have been relatively minor. The bathroom improvements, um, small exterior repairs all stuff in which that the Urban Renewal Fund has been able to uh, fund uh, basically through cash. Uh, now we're getting uh, 30 years out, 31, 32 years out into uh, a more expensive uh, capital uh, improvements. So uh, what we made a decision to do when I met with the ARP because those three buildings are still under their authority uh, and are anticipated to remain under their authority uh, uh, moving forward is to uh, borrow through the general fund uh, to make these improvements um, and then basically offset the amount of debt service associated with those improvements to the urban renewal fund. So there's really um, three major projects. Uh, replacing the roof of the Jefferson Cutter House, um, which is not a great revenue producing property for the town. Um, 23 Maple Street front porches is in a historic district. Um, so to replace the porches there, they're uh, in major need of uh, repair, and then lastly to fund the driveway and 
um, the turnaround in front of the Central School, which serves as a senior center. Um, so those are the three big projects that we propose to fund, and again, uh, it will not impact the general fund, but rather be funded completely through the Urban Renewal Fund. Um, the adjustment for Audison, um, we're nearing the end of that. Uh, we have it scheduled for FY16 and FY17. Again, we paid the entire, this is a non-exempt school project, so this was funded uh, with no help from the MSBA or the former SBA. Uh, rather, we uh, assume all the debt in the non-exempt plan, and we still do receive, uh, I shouldn't say we don't receive MSBA reimbursement, but it's handled differently. It's not, uh, the debt is, uh, uh, is not accounted for on the tax rate like non-exempt. Um, it's actual budget rather than exempt debt. So what we do is we offset basically a portion of what the MSBA reimbursement would be uh, rather than um, penalize the plan. Um, and then lastly, um, adjust for 2014 bond premium. Um, the town received a uh, bond premium uh, in their most recent borrowing, uh, which happened in uh, the fall of 2014, um, in just, just to excess of a million dollars. <coughs> um, we've applied the proceeds of that over five years. I'm going to go into much more detail on that uh, later in the presentation. Um, so after you apply the cash and non-cash offsets, uh, you get a net non-exempt plan, uh, which we basically apply to the performer budget. Um, you'll see we're uh, um, just at 5% in FY16, and moving forward, uh, that fluctuates to so an FY17, we're just about $35,000 over what the 5% would be, and then in 18, uh, 19, uh, and to a much lesser degree in 20, are below the 5%, but on an average five-year basis, uh, we're at 4.94%. Just a quick question so I understand the sheet. Um, I'm looking at the first line and the third line, so the prior non-exempt debt and the new non-exempt debt service. <coughs> so if I look at the new non-exempt debt service in 2016, I have 218600. Does that, in FY17, go up to line one, or is it carrying? Carries forward on that line. On the same line, and that's why one line's going down precipitously, and the other one's going up. Got it, all right. And it also picks up the new non-exempt debt from the next year. It's added in, in 2017. You've got the 2016 new debt and the 2017 new debt. Yes. Because each year we're doing more borrowing. And the, and the first year, first year we only calculate um, as a debt service one half of the interest rate no principal and then the second year you get the full interest rate and full principal right so I mean just so I so on so when we get to fiscal 20 and it talks about new non-exempt debt service of 3.8 million it's 800,000 of new debt service. well, well it's mm -hmm. all of the stuff in the plan new in the plan You're saying the same thing. in other words none of it's approved yet it's all new in the plan it's it's not I get it okay issued and authorized you. Got it. Okay. Okay. <coughs> on, on the I'm next, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. One other question. Uh, why in fiscal year 2018 does the uh, capital carry forward and antenna funds offset drop out? Well, it's 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 in the reserve. I mean, we don't have to put it out. We don't have to use it every year. So we don't use it if we don't need it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it, it, the deal with the um, town, town meeting and the, and the state when, when this um, was passed was that the funds that uh, are paid into the antenna uh, fund are used for parks and recreation. So, so when we have enough parks and recreation demand, either in direct new outlays or in debt service, we apply that. And if, and if we don't need it, we, we leave it in reserve. Okay. Do you know what the, um, uh, the yearly revenue from into the antenna fund is? No, just under 200,000. 200. Thanks. So, so. Okay, uh, Peter? Uh, is it possible to, to say in, in one or two sentences what the rationale is for all those adjustments? Uh, to to um, provide an accurate representation of what we're actually spending of the taxpayers' dollars in the in the current tax year, or say negatively. 
let's, capital let's take, budget is, is only what is only. Let's uh, take let's take for example the, the cash forward carry carry forward line. Okay. So uh, let's say two years ago we bought a fire truck for nine hundred thousand dollars, but we actually had <coughs> forecasted to be nine hundred and sixty thousand dollars. So that that cash, both there's two types of there's two types of funding there. There's what we call cash as a vote, and it's also borrowed money. Let's say it was borrowed money. So we went out and borrowed a nine hundred sixty thousand dollars, but because of good negotiations. We only spent nine hundred thousand. That money's been bonded. Uh, it's it's uh, it falls into certain categories that are governed by Chapter Forty Four of the Mass General Law. So we can take that money and spend it on something else. But it turns out it's got to be something like a fire truck or a piece of rolling stock capital equipment. Similarly, if we borrowed money from a, for a building, it would fall into a different category. But the money's there, it's, it's been bonded, and it can be spent. So if we take that money, and let's say the, the fire truck in two, 2002 years ago, and we put it against another piece of rolling stock, let's say a, a, dump, a dump truck, okay? We, we, we've lowered the capital expense that the taxpayer has to fund, and that's why that adjustment is made. Because at the end of the day, town meeting and ho hopefully the finance committee and town meeting will vote to authorize the bottom line of those numbers. John? Thank you. No, I, my, my question is Okay. Andrew, the uh, $200,000 premium, was that uh, from the last bond issue, was that all not exempt? All not exempt. Okay. So if part of it was exempt, you would have applied that share to the debt to the service? Exempt debt. Any other questions? Okay, so you have a sort of a, a, a thirty thousand foot or maybe a hundred foot view of the finances <coughs> of the capital plan. So now we'd like to go into a little bit more of the qualitative issues. Um, we we'll discuss the community safety departments, including the buildings. Um, when we say recognizing the Community Preservation Act, as you know, the Community Preservation Act was passed uh, last November. Um, it's actually not going to be sort of rolling into the financial planning and budget until a, a, a year from now, the next fiscal year, not, not 2016. But, you know, we, we, we want to sort of accommodate and understand how we're going to, how we're going to uh, recognize that in the, in the town's financing, financial plans. Um, Andrew will discuss more detail on the bond premium strategy. And then there's some uh, school things that we want to discuss and, and then the larger building projects that uh, are looming out there. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to Brian Rarig, who's going to talk to us about um, community safety and community preservation. Act. Uh, thanks, Charlie. Uh, so this building that we're sitting in, I think everyone knows, um, has been under construction for um, for several years now. Forever. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> it seems. Um, in what was to be the first two phases of a five-phase project. Um, the first phase was the renovation of the plaza out there and, and correction of the leaks that were plaguing the areas underneath the plaza. Uh, the second was the correction of the problems with the building on um, which were legion, and many of which dated back to the original construction of the building, uh, both some, some very questionable design and some construction that had that bear no resemblance, bore no resemblance to either the design drawing or the as-built document. Um, it has, it's taken yeoman service by the Permanent Town Building Committee and the architects for this project who are really to be applauded, um, getting this done even a year over um, schedule. Uh, but it has been, it has been completed. Uh, the building is watertight. Um, it is, it is not leaking. Um, the, f the subsequent three phases, which uh, th phase three, four, and five, as you can see on this slide, uh, were to be were to be phased over the coming years. In fairness to um, the police department that has suffered for and, and fire, who's, who've had to coexist in this building as well during this period, uh, given the um, the disruption to their operations that they've already had. Um, 
and the potential savings in doing those three phases as one, um, one mobilization. Um, it's been decided to combine them into, into one project. Um, the funding for the design of which was in last year's capital plan, the funding for the construction is in this year's capital plan. Um, as Andrew mentioned, it's going to bid shortly. It'll be awarded after, um, after town meeting, um, we hope, appropriates the funding for construction. Um, and just for perspective, uh, assuming that those numbers hold, the total eight-year investment in the building will be um, very close to $13 million. <coughs> That's the total for all the phases? Correct. Uh, moving on to the rest of the uh, police budget, um, uh, some, some very um, sort of traditional um, uh, cycles in these budgets include replacing a cruiser fleet on a three-year cycle, an annual replacement of, um, of radar units and body armor, uh, a, a couple of, uh, of upgrade projects, uh, including the evidence processing lab, a significant upgrade of the, the capabilities of, the, of evidence processing, um, restoration of the firing range, which was damaged by, yes, the leaks that mm -hmm. took place um, over the previous years, and an updating of the, the closed circuit TV and building security systems. All of those, <coughs> now, those were separate capital requests. You've seen them in out years in prior plans. They've now been folded into the, the renovation project, into the final single phase renovation project. Um, um, other notable items on the, on the budget are that uh, replacement, the complete replacement of the portable radio systems um, will be coming up in, in FY. 2020, that's a 200 and some thousand dollar um, project that may um, vary significantly from that number depending on some federal uh, standards that are coming down the pike for interconnectivity of, uh, of public safety communications devices. Um, and, and finally, last year a lot of people remarked on the fact that the new canine officer was a capital expenditure and we appropriated $10,000 for, uh, for a new dog. Um, for the police department um, because the, the existing dog had aged out. Um, the new one has born, been born, identified. The way it works is a breeder identifies a dog for the Arlington Police Department when it's born. It goes through many, many months of basic training and then a few months with uh, the handler who's going to be working with the dog. Uh, on, yes, sir. Uh, is there a, um, K-9 officer currently, or in between the dogs? Oh, no, there, there is. Um, yeah, the previous Dasty, I think, is right. Dasty's firm. still in service. Dasty's right? still in service, yes. Yeah. Yes, but, but um, he, she, hmm. he, she, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Will, have, will have aged out by the time this, this dog is ready. So what's your retirement yes. age for a dog? <laughs> I think 70 years. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I think it's about 70 years. Four <laughs> Uh, um, um, it's a fascinating process. The dog, the dog, the new dog could wash out of training at any point in the process. Um, there's no guarantee that uh, uh, that's. But that's why you have to start a little early um, in case this dog doesn't prove to be a good candidate. Uh, moving on to the the fire budget, um, the the central station project, which uh, Andrew alluded to earlier, um, is, is also phase two of a, of a two-phase project. The first phase was the, uh, uh, the envelope of the building, which was successfully completed a few years ago. Um, this phase is an entire uh, interior rehab, and um, uh, the project is uh, within its contingency budget and within a few weeks of schedule. Um, there have been some glitches. They've, they've been worked out between the, uh, the architect, the Permanent Town Building Committee, and the uh, contractors, and the chief, um, uh, who is a terrific client, and um, has, um, uh, they've together kept the, the project on track, despite things like a, a, a major structural problem with the, uh, the floor of the apparatus level. Um, which turned out the con construction of that concrete um, turned out to be very different from what was uh, uh, what was predicted when they did the original you know, forensic 
uh, investigation of it. Um, but they've recovered from that, and completion is still expected on July 1st. Um, when that's complete, again, just for perspective, the total four-year investment in the station will be just about $8 million. Um, there is no appropriation in this year's plan, by the way, for that station. That was appropriated last year. Um, and in fact, there are no um, capital requests in FY16 for the fire department. Uh, but looking ahead, there is a request for FY17 for a, a tower unit, which is a ladder truck with a, a, a tower on the end of the ladder, a platform on the end of the ladder, um, that's thought to be a much more effective uh, uh, piece of apparatus. That's a $1.1 million truck. Um, and the following year, uh, we're scheduled to replace a pumper uh, uh, to the tune of $600,000. Um, as I mentioned with police, the radio system for uh, fire uh, ages out after 12 years as well. They're on the same cycle. They will be replaced at the same time um, and with compatible equipment. But what that equipment is, again, depends on uh, <coughs> what comes down the pike for, for federal, federal guidelines. Cool. Before we jump to the next slide, I'd just yeah. like to mention that when this fire st central fire station is completed on July 1st, we will have completely renovated and upgraded three fire stations in town in, in the last 10 years. So that's some sort of a way I'm not going to ask. This is more of a general question. Um, just looking at this and seeing that it's a four year plan and the fact that the money's already appropriated. It actually takes four years to rehab that station? Um, Time wise to, if for a contractor to come in and do it? Or is that just because the funding comes in? It? No. It took. Uh, about two years start to finish to complete the envelope work. Andrew, is that fair? Right, and yeah. then another I mean, two years for, to do that. And, and then another two years to, to plan and, <coughs> uh, and execute the interior. So that's just the real time frame? Yeah. Well, actually, the envelope was that's accelerated over the, we, we, we did the, started that early, broke, breaking it out of the, the basic plan because uh, pieces of the cornices? Yeah. The, things on the top, the gargoyles the, or whatever, the gargoyles. they started falling down. <laughs> so uh, it was a hazard to the fire firefighters and to the public. So that portion okay. of the project was accelerated and then we went into the no normally planned phase. But so what I'm hearing is it's just, that's just basically the, the time it takes to build to, to yes. do it. Correct. Okay. John, Thank you. Oh, Alan. In uh, various discussions about regionalization, a number of the facilities in the community safety building came up, and I specifically remember the evidence lab and uh, um, the uh, uh, shooting range as being good candidates for regionalization. I was wondering if that's been part of it. it there was a, as, as, the, as the planning uh, allowed for maybe other local departments to come in and share the facilities? It, it was part of the discussion in sort of in both directions. Um, do we need these facilities? Could we share other people's? Or if we have them, can we um, you know, rent space to, to, to others? Um, the, the answer, I mean, the chief made a persuasive case on both of those that, um, that, that Arlington was significantly benefited by having the facilities here. Um, both, in both cases, you, know, you either have to, you have to send evidence out and wait for it to come back um, and, and pay for the service. Or you have to send officers to some other firing range to requalify periodically, and pay them to do it. Um, and and in both cases, they they persuaded us that it was worth um, upgrading the evidence lab and restoring the firing range. Ah, okay. <clears throat> oh, still me. Uh, so, uh, um, many of you know I had very strong um, positions on the Community Preservation Act, but just to be clear, I'm presenting the committee's um, position here. Um, the voters accepted uh, CPA last fall, um, voting to impose a 1.5% surtax on their um, property tax bills subject to, to certain abatements and, and exclusions. Um, 
that 1.5% surcharge will amount to something just over a million dollars. In addition, there may be some, there will be some uh, contribution by the state. We can't say what that percentage will be. Uh, those funds are uh, uh, restricted to expenditure on affordable housing, historic preservation, open space, and outdoor recreation. Some projects that fall under those headings, specifically um, historic preservation and, and recreation projects, such as rehab or playgrounds, are um, projects that or describe projects that are already proposed in the capital plan in out years. Um, and, and therefore are being funded, will be funded by, by non-exempt um, tax revenues. The um, expenditures from the Community Preservation Act fund um, require approval by a Community Preservation Committee, which town meeting will be creating this year uh, through a new bylaw. Um, so the committee doesn't exist yet. The, the possibility exists for um, the kinds of projects that I just described, historic preservation and recreation projects, um, to be funded by, by CPA funding if that committee um, rec so recommends and town meeting approves. Again, town meeting has to fund, has to approve all appropriations no matter what the, what the source. Um, the Capital Planning Committee has taken the position that um, the, the town should have the opportunity to consider funding those projects with exempt dollars, the CPA dollars. And therefore, um, we've set aside all of the, the projects that may be eligible for CPA funding in, um, in a, a separate category called CPA. Um, to allow that newly formed committee and town meeting to consider whether it wants to fund some of those projects with, with CPA funding. Um, that will be up to that committee and town meeting. If um, for whatever reason those funds are unavailable or um, uh, the, C the CPA committee and town meeting um, decline to fund certain projects, then the capital planning committee stands ready to reconsider them. They have already been vetted by town staff. That's why they're in the plan in the first place. Um, but, uh, and importantly, nothing has been um, unfunded in fiscal 16. So the plan that is before you and the vote that will be before a town meeting fully funds all of those requests, even those that might be CPA fundable um, in fiscal 2016, because there is a CPA committee yet, there isn't the opportunity to consider funding those things through CPA. Um, <coughs> Are those the items in, in italics? Correct. Mm -hmm. In the five-year plan, yes. Well, what page you in the five-year plan is documented? It's the oh, second yeah, appendix to the audit What right. page is that on? It's a separate, the separate it's document. It's back. It's the, the spreadsheet with the five years. It's, it's in the main one. So if you look on the second page, the window where Robin prepared, got it. Or an italic. There we go. Oh, you italicize it. Sorry, we're, we're seeing this particular version for the first time. Couple questions about those projects. Are, are they included in the five percent calculation? No, no. Um, in general, only in fiscal sixteen. Yeah, only in yeah. sixteen. In general, uh, would these be sort of do it or not do it, depending on recommendations of the committee, or do it now and do it versus do it later, or, or maybe a mix of those. In other words, if 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 the CPC recommends funding or not. Would that eliminate those projects or just delay them in general? Or, or if the CPA you mix, right? which did you mean? If the CP, you said if somebody recommends funding or not. Well, let's say there's a project that's eligible. Yeah. If the CPC does not recommend funding it from CPA funds, meaning this community preservation committee. Yeah, we have community preservation committee. Problem. Yeah, we do have an acronym Capital problem. Yeah. Yeah, CP, CPC is commonly used across the state to refer to. Community Preservation Committee. Right. 
Oh. Here we refer to this committee that way. So we have, yeah. we have to yeah. clean Sorry. that up. So. <laughs> um, and the Community Preservation Committee does not recommend funding those. Did that, would that in general mean those projects would not get done or that they would be done sometime later as they fit into the usual calendar? I, we'd have to look at it. I mean, I, one of the things, that there's a bullet here which um, you didn't quite get to. Um, I skip something? Yeah, the yeah, last, the last bullet, bullet, which says the segregation oh. of the CPA eligible projects facilitates the town's financing of Stratton School Project. So in the, in the current five-year plan, um, those funds that might have been spent on the CPA eligible projects are being put into the financing of the Stratton School. Now, if, you know, I mean, I'm, again, I'm not going to speak for the committee here because we haven't really... Uh, done that and likewise we can't answer your question because we haven't evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis but if there was no CPA we still would have to fund the Stratton school so some number of projects would move out you know they might be the parks and recreation or they might have been some other projects but we'd still have to face up to the Stratton school <coughs> project Carol <coughs> there is, um, although the exact form of it will depend on the bylaw proposal that the select can bring to town meeting. <coughs> Excuse me, short version is that there are at least five members, statutorily, there are five members, each of whom is appointed by an appointing authority, the planning board, the uh, Parks and Recreation Commission, the Housing Authority, um, the Historic Commission, and another entity that I'm forgetting, the Concom. Conservation. Yeah. The Concom. Um, and then there can be up to four other members, so the committee can be between, be between five and nine. I believe the second selectmen are going to propose a nine-member committee. Um, so there's those five that are, that are designated slots and four others that can be appointed in some other fashion. Um, that's right. I think it's between the selectman and the manager okay. uh, is, is what the selectman appear to, to be intending to bring to town meeting. Uh, it, it seems to me that this might get rather complex in the sense that the two different committees have to come to common ground about what would be funded by CPA or not and, mm -hmm. and, and CP, CPC. Have you all thought through the how that process might happen? Uh, or are, are no, no. <laughs> okay. All right. No, I mean okay. it, it's hard to it's hard to think it through when there's no committee. Yeah, I understand. Okay. But but I I would say that um, uh, you know for example the CPC Capital Planning Committee has managed to work out a funding program with the finance committee that's been in place for 20 years or 30 years and has worked. So there's no reason to believe that you couldn't do something similar um, with another committee. I mean, that's uh, just because the committee exists doesn't... No, I, I, did, I didn't think there would be difficulty. Just, yeah. that, you know, the timing and all has to happen so that things yeah. get voted properly at town meeting. If the, if the, until, the, until the committee's in place, it's hard to have a yeah. conversation with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jonathan. Yeah, just um, for 2017, it looks like from what I can see, the italicized amounts add up to about six hundred thousand dollars. Are there any others? Sounds about right. Well, typically, no if there. one recreation project runs anywhere from three hundred thousand to five hundred thousand dollars, so you know, so it could easily it could easily get to that number. I don't have it memorized. Right, you're you're looking at it happens. There's no major playground project. Program. Um, 
Oh, so it's mostly Whittemore. Ro it's mostly <coughs> historical. <coughs> Actually, there is. There's another. There's another five hundred fifty thousand dollars for uh, Where is that? Robin's Farm. So just a one point one million. Right? <coughs> That's right. If you look back under recreation, John. <coughs> on the third to last page. <coughs> Appointments made constitute itself in the fall. It can conceivably make some recommendations to town meeting uh, next year. So, sorry, so in fiscal year 2017, we were talking 1.1 million? About that. Yeah. So, you said earlier that it's about the one and a half percent surcharge is about a million dollars, and then there'll be some. Something coming to the state. Yeah, probably about one point one between one point one and one point two plus a state. Um, the state contribution this year was in the high twenty percent range. So about two hundred thousand. And the one thing to consider the one thing to consider that obviously the committee has been created, but you do have the ability to bond against it. So it may not be all cash for all these projects. It may be a debt service payment. So those are all the things that we decided as we move forward. And next year, of course, they'll have double. They'll have two years. Yes. Two I, years I, of revenues. Yeah, I was going to point that out. The, because <coughs> the plan doesn't get constituted, and the surcharge begins being collected this July. <coughs> excuse me. By the time it makes its first set of recommendations, it'll actually be able to um, recommend appropriation of essentially two fiscal years worth of collection. In your one. Thank you. Okay, what? Charlie, do we we vote the capital budget as a dollar item, not a line item? We don't vote it by line item, we buy it, vote it by the total dollar at town meeting. No, no. you vote the lines. You vote, you, vote, uh, you vote the lines, you vote the categories. Um, there's a cash category, and each, each item is listed, but they're voted in four separate votes. Right, we, so we vote by category, but we don't buy, vote by line items of the, of the approach. Like we don't vote for like photocopiers and this park and that park. Well, they're so. enumerated. Let's put it that way. And the well, borrowing would be specific. Yeah, I mean, you don't vote. You don't vote for every uh, police officer by name in the police budget. You vote personnel, but all the positions are listed in the in the vote. Yeah, and no, it's no. The no, same it's thing. Same thing with the capital budget. In each of the categories, whether it's cash debt, other, or whatever, <laughs> it's voted by category, mm -hmm. and um, all of the things that are being voted are listed. Right. The only reason I brought it up was, I, and you can correct me, Brian would probably know, the Community Preservation Committee will have to get approval by line item. They don't do a bulk. That's right. There's a little bit of a disconnect. They have a different <laughs> process. I was trying to make sure I understood. It is a little bit of a different process. I mean, presumably, the Community Preservation Committee will to come to, to FinCom and, and be talking with the Capital Planning Committee along the way um, and get FinCom's endorsement. But, but that's true. Community preservation fund appropriation um, can be done by town meeting only with the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee. And, and they do have to recommend specific projects. Correct. I was just, what I was trying to do is I was trying to get to the thought of trying to navigate with the two. And one of the challenges is, I'm not saying it would happen, but in theory, the Capital Planning Committee and the Community Preservation Committee can agree that this project that was in the Capital Plan is going to go out, let's say in 17, it's going to come out of Capital Planning and go into Community Preservation. And the town meeting can reject it. So now it's got to come back in 18, probably conceivably. Is that Okay, I just wanted to understand sure. mechanically if I had it correctly. Okay. Okay, um, moving on, uh, Andrew is going to give us a, a brief uh, tutorial on bond premium uh, line item that's new in the adjustments um, to, the, to the capital plan. Um, and it, it's, um, well, Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Charlie. Uh, so yeah, thanks, uh, when I uh, when we went uh, line by line uh, mm -hmm. with regard to the financing of the five-year plan, uh, I had pointed out a non non-cash offset 
uh, that would cause the FY14 uh, bond premium. So uh, one thing we decided uh, pretty quickly was that we needed to uh, develop some consensus amongst the, the internal staff and with the capital planning committee as to how the town is going to apply bond premiums moving forward. Um, so just to walk you through the slide, bond premium defined in its most basic terms, a uh, one-time payment to offset higher interest costs associated with borrowing. Uh, with regard to the most recent borrowing, uh, the premium was a million seventy-eight thousand dollars, give or take a few dollars. Um, and one of the things that uh, we're talking to DOR and uh, the the individual who audits us uh, for DOR was that the proceeds from a bond premium uh, must be returned in some way or another to the general fund. Um, so the town's policy um, was based on the following: return funds to the return funds to the general fund provide uh, relief to the capital plan because we are incurring higher interest costs associated with borrowing within the non-exempt plan, um, and then not requiring appropriation from free cash, uh, which would uh, otherwise have jeopardized some of our commitments from um, the long-range plan. And not to go into a great deal of detail about that, but one thing in talking to DOR is if we wanted to do a direct cash offset, we would have to appropriate from free cash, and we don't typically do that at town meeting other than the 50% of the balance is an operating revenue. So we ruled that out. Um, pretty much uh, from the onset. Uh, so the implementation of the bond premium policy. Uh, the town through its treasurer uh, will borrow a full amount needed to fund projects and equipment within capital budgets. Uh, there will be an application of non-cash offset to bottom line of capital budget and plan. And that amount will be fixed on total amount of bond premiums. So with regard to the current five-year plan, there's a million dollar premium. We divide it by five. It comes to $200,000 $200, and then uh, 200 $600, $200,000, I believe. Um, and we apply that in each year of the plan. It basically reduces uh, the non-exempt burden and uh, gets us within closer uh, to the 5% or within the 5% in some instances. Um, so subsequently, in every year uh, we do that, the treasurer will release that exact same amount to the general fund. So what the town has right now is a bond premium account. It, you don't require an appropriation from an account like that to free cash. Rather, when she closes out the end of the year, she'll just release that $200,000 to the general fund. So at the end of the five years, the million dollars gets returned to the general fund. The capital plan uh, gets relief um, in the term of the non-cash offset. Um, and lastly, uh, this plan uh, is supported uh, by the town manager, the comptroller, uh, the treasurer, and the department of revenue. So, um, uh, we think it's a good way moving forward. What you know, <coughs> we anticipate there'll probably be future bond premium. So we've defined it as 2014 bond premium, um, in order to apply the same policy as we move forward. So if next year we get another bond premium, you'll see 2015 bond premium, um, and that applied five years out. So um, where do those funds show up in the budget? So basically, you won't see it as a budget or an appropriated fund. Um, because you don't have to appropriate from the bond. Uh, uh, but you have you show revenues in your budget, in your budget book, I should say. So basically, it'll be an amount released to free cash at the end of the year when you see the closeout from uh, the control and DOR. Free cash. It'll be a free cash. It's a bit of a paper transaction here. It's a complete paper transaction. Because the money's going into free cash, right. but they're using it to offset um, because the debt service is higher. Yeah. Let me because just. Of that. Let me just. But basically, let's assume. The treasurer goes out to sell some bonds, and there's three bidders. Okay, so two of them might say, "Okay, we'll buy we'll buy these twenty million dollars worth of bonds, but our interest rate is going to be four point two five percent." Maybe the other one says it's four point three five percent, and then another guy says it's two percent. So one of the four percent guys, in order to compete against the two percent guy, says, "Well, I'm not going to lower the interest rate to to two percent, but I'm going to give you a million dollars in cash. That's the premium." So it's effectively lowering the interest rate. And what we're trying to do here is capture the lower interest rate in the capital budget so that the treasurer is free to choose the, the lowest real interest that the town pays and, and not um, deprive the town, uh, the capital plan of, of being able to, you know, uh, in an organized fashion, plan its future debt service. Probably, that was probably confusing, right? When? Um, so what did we used to do with bond premiums? Did we used to get them? And I, I don't remember when we had one. It, it's, well, it's not been this large. It, it's, uh, it's really a, a product of the extremely low interest rates 
over the last four, five, six years. If you go back to 1995, the premiums might have been $1,500 or something like that. So it's, uh, it's because of these ultra low interest rates that we're getting these big premiums. If the interest rates start going back, the premiums are gonna start coming down. So it's a, probably a short term issue, short term in a few years. Okay, so moving on to the uh, planning. One, one, one more question. What happens if it goes the other way? We have In other discount. words, the, the anticipated interest mm -hmm. is lower than what, what actually. Statute doesn't say. allow for doesn't to allow. accept discounts. Okay. So it's yeah. you'll get lower premiums, but you won't get discounts. Okay. So next, uh, planning community development. Um, so let me uh, suggest. Um, you want, Barbara, you want to talk about the planning? I do. I'm, I've been asked by the Capital Planning Committee to <coughs> track, comment, and report on the long-range master planning process. I think this comes under the category of reporting. I used, in, in watching the, the uh, evolution of the master planning process, and I understand Carol Kowalski has presented to you and you're all familiar with it, I've, I've used the lens of we're watching it of does the master planning process encourage uh, the long-term fiscal stability of the town that's been my primary lens as I looked at it and I think there are, are a couple of things that that I looked at particularly uh, the the focus on the opportunities uh, to to generate a greater revenue in designated areas in the town and to focus on updating the regulatory tools in the town, specifically zoning, which is a very old, it's a, it's a, as a, uh, it's a binary system. You, you, you can either build it or you can't. I mean, it's a very simplistic, blunt tool, and zoning has evolved uh, to give us much more control over how we want our town to look. And then, Andrew, um Part, you know, part of the long-range plan is actually going to be what Arlington Center looks like and how we deal with parking issues there, and that's always a favorite subject of the finance committee. <laughs> so, <maybe. laughs> Thanks again, Charlie. Um, so uh, we funded uh, the capital budget funded uh, parking downtown parking study um, a year or so ago uh, in the amount of thirty thousand um, dollars, and uh, the reason we want to bring it to your attention is that uh, through that study and that working group. Uh, recommendations were developed um, and regulations were adopted uh, by the Board of Selectmen uh, that I really think are going to have a, a pretty significant impact um, on not only parking regulation in Arlington Center but uh, revenue generation as well. So I'm going to fly through them. Um, if anyone parks in any of our metered lots right now, you know the technology is um, failing. Um, they have exceeded their useful lives. So uh, as part of the plan, we're going to replace um, the four existing kiosks in the lots. In addition, um, there's going to be an installation of street metering, so street meters just from about an, and from about mill to um, where the central station is, um, and it will be uh, the newest technology. You'll be able to use credit card uh, coin right at right at the meter head, uh, very similar to if you park in Davis Square. I think you'll see similar technology. Um, there's going to be a formation of a parking governance committee um, that uh, includes membership from a. Uh, uh, TAC, uh, the selectman, the town manager, the treasurer, uh, serving in the capacity of the parking clerk, uh, the police department, uh, and some other stakeholders. Um, and then uh, the way we're going to handle proceeds from this, obviously, uh, pro, you know, when you enhance regulations, there's a violation impact, and then there's a revenue generation impact. Um, right now, we budget within, in terms of revenue, um, basically two money streams within local receipts, one being meter revenue, and then one being violation uh, revenue. So what essentially would happen is anything generated would hold the general fund harmless in terms of uh, the revenue that goes to the general fund and we use to balance the budget. And then everything in excess of that um, would be used to uh, fund the acquisition of any technology that's necessary uh, or any uh, services that are required for with, uh, operation of the meters. And then lastly, um, set aside a, a sum of money to invest directly within the boundaries of the parking district. So um, sidewalk improvements, streetscape improvements, uh, lighting enhancements, um, anything that makes pedestrian travel, uh, vehicle travel, 
um, visitors, residents uh, visiting the center, uh, anything that benefits that area. So I think um, probably as soon as next year, uh, in the other section of the capital budget, you'll see uh, some level of investment in um, either infrastructure or technology associated uh, with implementing the regulations that have been adopted. Um, and then lastly, uh, just to summarize with regard to the master plan and uh, the parking study, there is no funds in the capital plan as of today. So I'd just like to s make sure that everybody understands that when we get this new capital equipment, when you're in the Punjab restaurant and your meter's running out, your, your cell phone's going to get a message that it's time to go out and put more money in the meter. Isn't that right? And, and you so can do it from your phone. <laughs> so <laughs> you, know, you don't have to get up. Okay, cool. Well, I have a question. So have you found how much these going to cost it to put the metering on this street? In terms of revenue generation? Yeah. Um, they still have to settle on rates, so there'll be a little bit of... Um, Discussion there, um, but it's it's, it's going to be relatively significant. I think the number they've been talking about is a dollar an hour, and what they're going to do is they're going to flip it. So right now, you're going to have an opportunity to stay day long in the lots, which you currently don't have, yeah. with the uh, concept of parking on the streets more desirable. So we're going to try to uh, have greater turnover. Um, so we're in the process of developing a, a basically a performance budget based on revenue, and I'm happy to share that with you. They're going to be individual meters. Um, so what they're going to probably be is two, spa two, meters to a, uh, two spaces to a meter, so two heads on one pole. Uh, Len? Uh, I thought they had kiosks in the capital plan last year. Yeah. Right, so we funded uh, kiosks uh, at $53,000, and the reason we didn't proceed is because we wanted to make sure, we saw which direction this was going, right. and with whatever technology we invested in, we wanted to make sure they're compatible. So, so those you funds will be... You can use that funds for these going forward, though? Correct. Okay. Carolyn? So we're going with Cambridge and Somerville rates, not Lexington rates. Uh, right now, not Lexington rates. Um, <laughs> like I said, it's still a matter of discussion. So that's why we're going to uh, have a parking governance committee. Okay, but this will be next year. Right, okay. nothing's not oh, sure. And one follow-up? Yep. Is it one hour or two hours? Again, those, those details are still, okay. still, still in the works. Okay, Brian? Um, forgetting the actual price, um, you're going to have to hire a couple people to write, or to write parking tickets because the parking tickets, like the, during Snowmageddon, there was cars parked everywhere, no tickets on anything, which I understand was the town's um, response to it. But you're going to have to, I assume, at least hire one or two people to maintain staff with that. Because I've spoken to the guys that are they're writing the parking tickets, and they're only supposed to go to certain places and things like that. Yeah, it's um, it's part of the whole uh, plan to fund those costs. And, and, that, and so the, that would come from this revenue. It wouldn't come from the the the, the uh, expectation is the general fund on the revenue and expense side will be held completely harmless. Okay, so Al. Also, yeah. Quick question: Can we give them consideration to uh, I know you have the Kiosk inside the parking lot, so that makes sense. But a number of communities have them on the street. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that you not you don't have a meter every two parking spaces, and you can go to that kiosk and you can get a slip, get your get your ticket, and go basically any place where there's a parking space on the street. We um, talked to a lot of people about it, and it's been done successfully in both places. Uh, the decision was made here uh, to do the metered spaces. Brookline had a, a particularly bad experience. They did the kiosk and that wound up pulling them out um, because there was so much concern from the elderly community and the disabled community about having to travel further. Uh, in order to access the, uh, the kiosk. But that being said, it, I mean, it works very well in a lot of places. Um, but okay, Alan? But I spend a lot of time in Brookline. I think they've tried everything, so there's a lot of... <laughs> they, they have tried everything. <laughs> <laughs> this, 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 sounds, this sounds a little bit like it could be an enterprise fund. Was that considered? Right, so there's some... Uh, you, we, you know, we've talked about it. Um, there are sections of general law that allow it to operate at essentially as a general, uh, an enterprise fund without actually being one. Uh, there's some language very specific uh, to the administration of parking and parking revenue. So uh, I think we're looking at those options right now. But essentially would operate very similar. Okay. Uh, Carol? I just want to voice concern about using parking meters as revenue rather than regulation. And based on what you're saying, I'm, here a lot, I'm hearing a lot of excitement around revenue and not a lot of focus on regulation. And I think um, that we're much better off with a focus on regulation rather than revenue. 
And one of the, you know, when we actually put out the RFP for the study, we basically said that the focus of this is about parking management rather than just revenue generation. You know, the goal is to better manage parking, and if we can make improvements to the district, it's a plus. Thanks. Okay. Ed Burns Arena. Sure. So um, <coughs> there's been some discussion uh, surrounding the, uh, the chargebacks to the uh, Ed Burns Arena Enterprise Fund <coughs> with regard to uh, capital improvements. So uh, I'm going to walk you through this. Uh, the first line on this spreadsheet is existing rent debt. So that's debt service uh, associated with basically two, uh, two borrowings that are still on the books. Um, you'll see how that looks over five years. Um, the FY16 capital budget um, includes $275,000 in investment in electrical upgrades. Um, we projected debt service, uh, basically fixed amount um, in each year of the plan. Um, so those are the things that are actually planned at this point. So what I had hoped to do um, is basically show you that depending on which direction the rink wants to go in, um, what they would be able to contribute uh, <coughs> to the debt service associated with the rink. Uh, the, 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 the commitment uh, certainly for the past several years has been that the, the rink uh, needs to offset 50% of the debt service. Um, so in 16, uh, you'll see they're offsetting uh, just under 52% um, with the new debt service in 17. Uh, with the, along with the existing debt service, um, you'll see that actually goes up to 70%, and that's because they're planning to increase their rates by $15 an hour and earmark those funds specifically to debt service, and that comes to about $27,750. So the way it works right now is of their rate of approximately $290, $45 each hour, each hour block of time goes to a debt service. That's why. When you're looking at that budget, you see an expense, 83000 You see revenue, 83000 It's just how they break it out. Um, and then, uh, beginning in 18, this discussion, nothing's included in the plan right now for a much, um, much more significant project, an $800,000 project uh, that would include the renovations um, and then the enhancements of the locker rooms. Um, initially, this came to the Capital Planning Committee this year as a million-dollar request, electrical and the locker rooms together. Um, and we uh, concluded uh, pretty quickly with the support of uh, the Director of Recreation, um, that it probably didn't make sense right now. So what he's going to do in the next couple of years is have a discussion um, with the rink folks and the users in that if they increase rates another $15, so basically $30 over a two-year period, is that worth having an, uh, an enhanced facility? Um, there's no decision that's been made. What I had hoped to do is just show you that if they say, yes, it's worth it, and yes, we're going to increase the rates by $15 an hour, we still offset the debt service by 50% moving forward. Um, so again, the entire plan is based on incremental increases, um, and uh, there'll be a lot more discussion uh, as we move forward. So the next subject is the town-owned buildings, and um, <coughs> um, so uh, there's really two parts of town-owned buildings: is the urban renewal fund buildings. Um, which are basically outside of the general fund, the central school at uh, 23 Maple Street and Jefferson Cutter House. Um, one tenant in 23 Maple, uh, several tenants in Central, uh, and then the chamber in the uh, Dallin Art Museum uh, in Jefferson Cutter. Uh, the current fund balance uh, there is $290,000. Um, again, they fund all their capital, uh, they fund uh, their own expenses, um, and then they also provide relief to the general fund in the form of paying 50% of the salary of uh, the building manager, the building craftsman, and 50% of the administrative assistant uh, in the planning department who really processes a lot of the bills associated with the building. Um, the Gibbs School, everybody uh, is under lease uh, through FY17, part of the, uh, the last uh, renewal process. They not only pay their rate, which escalates at 2% each year, they also pay um, a capital contribution. Um, the same holds true uh, with the Parmenter School. Uh, their leases are set to expire in 2019. Um, the Dallin Library, which has one tenant, it's ACMI. Uh, the lease is currently expired. Um, we're in the process of discussing um, whether or not we're going to begin uh, negotiations. I expect we will uh, relatively shortly. Um, Ryder Street, the current lease is through the end of this fiscal year, but there's a lease in effect that will extend it five years beginning July 1. Um, Mount Gilboa House is occupied. Um, we collect just about $2,000 a month there. Um, and again, that lease uh, expires May 31st of this year. 
Um, and while <coughs> you may not see it uh, with the Dell and Library this year, all buildings are projected to show positive cash flow uh, by the end of the year. What I did to try to uh, illustrate an accurate picture is I applied any debt service costs associated with the buildings. So all the debt associated with the general fund buildings um, is funded through the capital budget. But what I did is I pulled it out and I applied it as an expense to each of these buildings so that the Finance Committee could see uh, an, accur an accurate depiction of whether or not uh, the building was uh, being profitable based on not only uh, the rents and the normal expenses we incur, uh, but also the expenses associated with um, capital investment. Uh, so that's where we are. Um, if the committee's interested, I have a report that uh, goes into much more detail on each building uh, that I'm happy to share with the Finance Committee. Could you, uh, could you email that to uh, Corey? Sure. And then, Corey, if you could ship it around. Thank you. Great. Okay, the next uh, brief update on SIMS. Uh, this, this is the last capital budget meeting that we're going to be reporting on SIMS. This is, in, in our view, this is now history. Andrew? Uh, very quickly, uh, as of August 2014, 100% of the condos, townhouses have been sold. 90% um, of uh, the rental units have been leased. Uh, there's some uh, units still available. Uh, this year in FY15, um, the projected tax revenue from uh, the Arlington 360 project is $909,000, um, an additional $162,000 associated with Brightview Assisted Living. Uh, for total um, tax revenue uh, generation from uh, the project of uh, just under $1.1 million, uh, we're still anticipating uh, retiring all debt associated uh, with the project, uh, with purchasing the property. Uh, in 2022, um, the FY16 debt service payment uh, is $674,675. Obviously, the revenue um, from the, the project completely offsets that. Therefore, there is no longer a need to raise revenue on the tax rate in the form of excluded debt to offset uh, the debt service cost. How's the uh, right view assisted living doing? Still enough. So it's been, it's been successful so far. Okay, but you don't know occupancy? No, but I can find out for you. Okay. Next subject is a, this is perhaps a new term that uh, you haven't seen before. It's sort of evolved in our discussions with the Capital Planning Committee, uh, and that's this uh, planning for this quote unquote civic lot campus. And Barbara? Yes, thank you. Uh, the civic. The civic block is the area that includes the town hall, the central school, Maple Street Library, etc. It's that uh, it's that general area, and, and I want you to visualize it as a city block that's that's potentially an iconic town center for Arlington and for Arlington government because we are being asked to to <coughs> make piecemeal investments. Uh, on individual parcels one at a time and I think we're being short-sighted in not thinking of it as a city block and what it, we want it to look like for the long-term future. Um, you'll see in the in the budget we have some expenses for the senior center feasibility study which is the uh, central school <coughs> and uh, some much more hefty investments down the road over over half a million dollars in just making the improvements for what that current use is. So what, when we look at this, um, I think it's important to think of the campus and take, think about what careful smaller steps we're going to take as we step into a bigger picture of the future rather than just incrementally making decisions. That's kind of how we're looking at it. For example, some of the questions that, that we are hoping will begin to be answered or at least asked in the initial feasibility study for the senior center is um, are there other space needs in the town that could be better fulfilled in that current space and might a senior center be better someplace else? We can switch a little bit. Uh, are there opportunities for generating revenue in some of these facilities that we haven't looked at? Are we maintaining the physical Physical, physical assets in a way that we need to for the use that we're thinking about that particular piece of this civic block campus. Uh, the Whittemore Robbins house and the carriage house and the cottage are one significant segment of that. If you have tried to 
uh, park in the parking lot of the Robbins Library, you have no doubt run into the Whittemore Robbins House and, and the two yellow buildings in the back. Those two yellow buildings in the back are now unused and what their future and they what their future should be is something that that needs to be determined and I think to quote Charlie it's probably over our pay grade to do that um, the senior center uh, again we, we have been asked to fund a space utilization study for using that uh, central school as a as a senior center but there may not that may not be the best senior center that Arlington can, physical space that Arlington can provide for its seniors. We're hoping that, again, that the feasibility study will raise some of those questions. Uh, they are looking to fix the circulation and bathroom access prob problems, but they're also looking to create a space that would be more attractive to young seniors. Moi, for example. Uh, so. So there are a lot of things to think about as we think about that building. Uh, same with the central school <coughs> overall. Uh, we rent out that space and we make money, but maybe we would be better off uh, using it for internal use ourselves. Thank you, Barbara. Just a little note at the bottom of the sheet here. Caroline, excuse me, Carolyn? The, the graveyard, is that for parishes or is that a town graveyard? That's an interesting question. I didn't consider it part of the central buck, civic buck. Does anybody know? It's in town. Really? Huh. Well, just add that right in. Graveyard. <coughs> what was the previous use of the uh, carriage house in the cottage? Carriage house, I think, has not been used for a, a decade or more. Uh, the cottage was rented out up until this past year and, and, and got so many problems with the, was rented out in this exchange. So the Whittemore Robbins House uh, ha runs events and there was sort of a trade. We'll let you live here with a below market rent if you're available to take tickets or lock the doors or something like that. But there were problems with the building which required replacing the windows and, and making some code fixtures in it if it was going to be a rental property. So it is another example of a rental property that the town sort of backed into discovering that it was operating. And, and at that point, we, we said, well, wait a minute. Let's, do we really want to, and there was, I think, a general feeling that we really maybe didn't want to be in the business of of owning one rental property at the end of the lane there. Okay, so, and so, okay. And so, here we go. Totally vacant. In, in prior to that, it was also used as a transitional house for Jermaine Lawrence. Right. Is For that, how long ago, that was, must have been. That was before the occupant, the, the, the occupant that you said. So people would, so the young women from Jermaine Lawrence would come and live there? Live there. Right. That's interesting. So I, I, I think I think it, it, we had a lot of discussion about this at the capital planning committee <coughs> meetings this year, and the, the, there are certain departments in the town that are proposing to do things here with really good intentions and and what I would call entrepreneurial thinking, but there's also is you know a lot of hidden liabilities. In other words, there's costs here that's going to grow and grow and grow, and what we're trying to do is uh, encourage the town like the gentleman on my left here, to uh, <coughs> think about this in a more holistic <coughs> sense and, and, you know, where do we, where do we want to go and how much is it going to cost us? If, rather than die a death of a thousand cuts, you know, to try to understand what the, what the real costs are. Be an excellent house for the deputy town manager. <laughs> oh. <laughs> are we live? <laughs> okay. Um, moving on, uh, maintenance committee update. Uh, I'm going to ask Barbara to give a quick uh, update on the maintenance committee, but I, I wanted to say, first of all, uh, especially I wanted to thank Barbara. Um, you know, on the capital planning committee, she's been a bit of a... Um, Nudge. A what? <laughs> Nudge. Nudge, yeah. There's a, um, I, uh, uh, there's a word I was trying to think of, but it doesn't come to me, but pushing us on this maintenance committee issue over the years, and not to take away from for any of the work that the Board of Selectmen or the town manager and various departments have done, but Barbara has been the uh, fire behind this uh, whole process. And as we saw the Finance Committee meeting the other night, it's resulted in the Facilities Department. So 
Barbara, thank you for doing that. Thank you, Charlie. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, well, I want to say thank you to you, I hope. I mean, I know it's premature to, you haven't voted on it yet, but you did hear our presentation last week, and it will, uh, I, I think it's going to make a big difference uh, for the town. It's, it's a perfect corollary to the work that the capital planning department or the capital planning committee does, and I hope the maintenance department or the facilities department will uh, do honor to the town. I, I think it will. So I want to thank you for considering it. Uh, I think we've already voted. No, we haven't. We haven't? Oh, take that back. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on, Parks and Recreation, Tony. Yes. <coughs> Thanks, Charlie. There, there are two uh, Parks and Recreation slides. The first one is for prior year projects, some of which we've already talked about, so I'll just walk through them with you. Uh, a couple of years ago, we funded an ADA evaluation of the playgrounds and other recreational facilities to determine uh, what deficiencies were. The report for that is on my, de on my uh, right here. It's the Institute of Human Center Design completed this report this year and identifies deficiencies at the various uh, fields and playgrounds and, and other, other facilities. So that study has been completed. Uh, the Spy Pond Tennis Courts, which was previously approved, uh, is currently out to bid. We expect construction in 2015. The Hippin School a Street a Playground is 95% complete, punch list items. There's an image down below on the right of the uh, almost completed park. And uh, the question I had to ask Joe is uh, those uh, tree looking features are actually steel, in case anybody. Uh, wants to know. The uh, North Union Spray Park has been completed. That's the middle photograph. And the Dallin Playground uh, has also been completed. We talked about the Magnolia uh, Field Basketball Court. That was uh, approved last year for $75,000. The plan is to combine that with a request in fiscal 16, which is now the second slide I'm looking at, $455,000. And basically <coughs> do it as one, one project rather than having a two-phase project uh, at that site. Another uh, notable item is $50,000 for a dividing wall at the gym, at the Gibbs gym. Uh, currently the, there are other tenants at, at the Gibbs. I think uh, Leslie Ellis is a primary one. And the, the, they need to share the gym. And in the past it's been a, a curtain put up and uh, other types of petitions, but uh, it, it's really not working, and uh, the noise is a factor, and uh, the uh, recreational director is proposing a, a dividing wall be constructed uh, in the gym for $50,000. Can that be a, a flexible one flexible. that pulls across? Power, electric power, it'll shut. Yes. Also, there's a, a request for $50,000, which will probably be an annual request <coughs> to implement some of the deficiencies noted in this report for ADA. I also would say that his request going forward all include implementation of requests. In other words, Magnolia Field includes recommendations that were made here, so the, it's being worked into the overall program that way as well. He'd like to buy a, a van uh, for some of the uh, kid programs. Uh, right now he leases or borrows a van. He thinks it's more cost effective to have their own van. And the other item is a, a safety fencing at Buck Field to protect Summer Street as well as protect the playground from the fly balls. A comment that Joe has made in the past is that he just wants to highlight that he has no maintenance funds. His maintenance dollars come through DPW, and so he just, I think at some point he'd like to have a better resolution of how that, how his maintenance gets done, other than having to go through the uh, DPW. So that's that's the part of my So Mike, I have full of questions tonight. Um, I used to live off of Magnolia Field. There's a flooding issue between the basketball court and the soccer field right there that often affects both of them, is that being incorporated, addressing that problem being incorporated into that? Right, that's, the issue is to take 
taking on as one project rather than trying to deal with <coughs> issues and drainage issues. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Mike. Um, Thank you, Charlie. So I don't have any pretty pictures like recreation did, so I'm all on one slide. Um, <coughs> so, previous year items, we have the FEMA grant, um, FY14 and FY15. There have been appropriations, and then the FY16 brings us to the 25% that the town needed to match. Um, <coughs> we just recently notified that they were, in fact, getting <coughs> from FEMA. Uh, the town yard renovation, uh, FY17, 700,000 goes to the design of it, the construction in FY19, the amount of $8 million. This estimate is a professional estimate. Um, we all took a site visit out to the, to the yard, and we saw the the disarray that it was in and, and the need for this. So that's coming down the pipeline in a couple of years. As Andrew touched upon um, at the beginning, the sidewalk ramp program is continuing on. Uh, they continue to add ramps where needed and to ver verify that the current ramps are still ADA compliant. Um, this current year's request, uh, the DPW Building C, the Spanish style roof is a tile roof. Uh, the, the repair cost is $230,000. The 70,000 remainder will go to the flat roof portion of it. That town hall this winter has caused some havoc on it. There's been leaking. Um, so the leaks will be the first item for the 100,000. If there's anything left over, they will go to repair the sidewalk in front of town hall, town hall as well, which has been dug up as well from, from this winter. And the cemetery, the chapel uh, is in need of renovation. There's an on-site insight audit. Um, the $175,000 will go to restore the building only. The retaining wall on Westminster Ave uh, in the amount of 99000 should improve motorist visibility. Um, and then going along with the winter theme, the snow fighters, there's five of them currently on staff, and all five of them will be replaced by fiscal year 20. Um, they each have a lifespan of around 25 years, so it just so happens that they're all coming due at this time. Yes. What's a snow fighter? Um, so it's the big... The big machine that's got the plow on it. And okay, the, 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 say no more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's got everything. Um, and then lastly, the Spy Pond bleachers. They used to be used for the football. Football field used to be played there, but now they're kind of limited use, I guess you could say. And so the cost for it would be 800000 not including ADA compliance. And so we need to discuss going forward if it's in the town's best interest to, to renovate the bleachers or to find some other use for it for that location. Okay, okay. Uh, Tony, if you could, since we had a discussion the other <coughs> night with the uh, superintendent for Minuteman, if you could just basically touch on this uh, Minuteman High School uh, cost issue. And right after? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should, uh, speaking of thanking people, to Tony is our former representative to the Minuteman School Building Committee. And the town is looking for a volunteer to uh, take his place. It's a great assignment. Anybody like to try it? <laughs> <laughs> See me out. The room, I'll but we do. Tony, Tony's put about two, three We're years into that right effort. Now. I wanted to acknowledge his great, great work there. Tony, go right ahead. All right. And so most of this you've already heard, but just to kind of quickly go through it, uh, the MS, the MSBA had a, a, a deadline for the submittal of feasibility and schematics. Uh, there were a couple of hiccups as far as the submittal, given the population discussion that was had in previous years. So there's a need to kind of step back and, and re redevelop the program to 628 students as opposed to 800 for 435. The MSBA, MSBA has given uh, Minuteman a, a grant extension, if you will, to allow that to happen. Uh, the plan schedule going forward is listed here. I'm not going to repeat it, uh, but basically looking to get through the program, get the uh, school committee to approve the new uh, program for the school, have it submitted to MSBA, uh, then go into a, what I'm going to call a campaign to get the district towns to, to buy into the funding uh, of the project and then possibly have construction in 2018. The, the thing I'd like to emphasize here is the, the allocation of cost. Now, right now, MSBA is at 20% of the participation. That percentage may go up as we go forward. 
for instance, the Thompson started at 40 and ended up at 50. So there's some, some growth that can happen in that percent contribution on the part of the state. The other stat is that uh, Arlington's about 35 percent of the in-district enrollment. So Arling, uh, as far as the non-state contribution, Arlington's on the hook for 35 percent plus or minus. Depends on the, the, the enrollment. The the in district, the 16 in district communities, uh, their student population is amounts to 60 percent of the of the population of the school. Uh, so in essence, there's 40 percent of the of that cost is for non district communities, and basically the in district communities are going to have to pay that upfront capital cost. I understand that there's some allowance for in the out of district uh, students to pay some of the capital cost going forward. However, uh, I guess my thought, and I'm the engineering techie, I'm not the financial techie on the committee, but the in district towns would have to float the bond. So build 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 a school and hope that the out of district Communities would still send their students there, even though they have to start paying a higher premium to send them there. There's also the uh, <coughs> Medford and Waltham, are both pursuing, which are the, one of the big contributors to the other district population, are funding their own vocational schools. So the slides that <coughs> you've already seen, I think the, this slide here that shows you overall costs as part of the MSBA program, you need to look at various options. Uh, look at renovation is option one, look at renovation with addition, and looking at a new school. And options four and five were developed by Minahan, uh, not by a consultant team, to arrive at costs if, uh, basically saying if you don't participate in MSBA and we do it on our own, options four and five are the overall cost that they project that the improvement would cost. So I guess my, my attempt to understand the financial breakdown, uh, slide number on sheet 29 kind of lays out uh, the way I view it. Uh, again, this is not a minute man table. This is uh, my own thoughts on it. So I know this is not something that minute man provided, all right? But the pie shot on the left shows the uh, and this assumes a $150 million school. It's going to vary. The numbers will vary, obviously, depending on what the option is. But the blue shows the 40% that the state would pay, which would be $60 million. And the rest of the cost, the $90 million, would have to be borne by the in-district communities. And the which is the maroon color, then the hatched maroon is Arlington's uh, percentage of that, a portion of that. So in this example, Arlington we would be paying $31.5 million to the project. And all of these costs, there's some notes down below, we, the, the assumption is made that all of the costs are going to be eligible for MSBA funding, which is not necessarily the case. Uh, there are limitations to what MSBA will pay for on site development, uh, geotech conditions, hazmat issues, and all those types of things. So uh, really the numbers up, up above, above or on the previous sheet don't re really don't reflect that. They also don't reflect that you may get a higher percentage from MSBA. So there's a little bit of probably offsetting that can happen there. But the, the image on, on the right uh, uh, is an attempt to identify that 24% of the cost that is non-state is really out there and would be hopefully assigned to the out-of-district communities at this point if they wanted to join, which I don't believe is going to happen. So, but if that were to happen, if the state were, let's say, uh, <coughs> out of the goodness of their heart, were to increase their percentage and take over that percentage, that Allington's share would be uh, just under two million, uh, uh, 20 million. 
So you can see the, the difference between Collington as well as the other towns that are in, in the district. So, uh, sure that if there's anybody that does want to get involved in yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll be glad to talk with you. I'll even buy you a cup of coffee and a day issue. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Any questions? <coughs> so, when when Minuteman was was here, they were going through their budget presentation, and um, there were a couple things that I found to be very frustrating. The first one was. And this has nothing to do with the building committee, but I'm just trying to explain it. They, their decision to decrease the population of the school has created a situation where you have a smaller number of kids over the same fixed cost base. So it's, you know, the overall budget goes up 1%, but Arlington share goes up 5%. Um, and then they started projecting out, and I was flipping through it and trying to find the page. But then they were flipping through their sort of forward looking projection of what the cost of the school would be mm -hmm. after with bills and the debt service and all that. And, and it seemed like they were almost working off of an assumption that the new building would not be any more efficient from a cost perspective than the current building. And I found that to be preposterous. So a bold part of it. But I feel like you can speak to the second one and sort of say, no, it's, it's a smaller building. Mean, well, I, I don't know that. I, somehow I think that's getting into a little bit of a speculative area. I think what we're just reporting on here we've been following the cost of this project and trying to help guide the project a little bit it's been very frustrating for all of us but I don't know that it's beneficial to speculate on the but on the schematics we have to know what the new building is how would can I uh, we're right now it's <coughs> uh, and we're staying here until all this is done including votes and such and we're going to hear a minute man again uh, in the future uh, so, you know, we could really focus on it then, and we'd love to have you come back. Um, but if, if, uh, if we could move along. Well, we yeah, it. what I would like to suggest is that this is brought to your attention because it's, it's, it's competing for funds with the, yeah. the next subject, which is, which is really investment in the Arlington Public School System. So, Diane is going to give us a summary of the status of the. Um, Arlington High School project. <coughs> the uh, some money we're spending this year on uh, school com additional school computer uh, acquisitions, and then on this on where we what the what, where we are with the Stratton and what the uh, project is that's ahead of us. So, Diane, can I turn it over to you? Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as you probably have heard at this point, Arlington was not successfully accepted um, with their submission last year to have a new high school project. So we will be resubmitting to the MSBA this spring to enter into the next round of potential funding. Um, th the situation hasn't really changed. The building hasn't miraculously <laughs> healed itself in the intervening time. But the state has to prioritize um, the pressures throughout the state. And since it is not an unhealthy building and it is not as of this moment have children hanging out of the windows you know we're, we're gonna have to keep going at this with the state until we rise up relative to the other schools I have to admit to a certain amount of trepidation um, on sort of a offhand thing we've had some photocopier repair issues and we heard from our lease company that they're unable to get repairmen to us because they're running all over the state fixing copiers that have been flooded by leaking roofs um, as the snow is beginning to melt. So I fear where that's, you know, we are not, as of yet, leaking heavily at the high school. Um, but I do fear that with the, the severe winter we had, that that's going to prioritize other, other projects potentially ahead of ours. But we'll see how that goes. I think the other thing to bring to your attention is that high school projects are enormously expensive um, when they're in large scope. Winchester High School, which is a building of fewer square feet, one vintage of original building, um, is a $130 million project under construction at the moment. Um, in terms of the square feet of the building, um, Arlington High School is most analogous to the Newton North project that, as you know, came in at $200 million. <laughs> Just in terms of square footage, you know, I'm not saying, you know, uh, Newton North went crazy and we wouldn't, but, you know, it, Arlington is a particularly challenging project <coughs> because it's three buildings of different vintages and then construction in between cobbling it together. So to do a thorough renovation of all of that is going to be extremely challenging. 
and challenging projects usually cost money. So we don't have a hard number. We won't have a hard number. It's a long process, but just to make you aware of that. Um, in terms of school computer acquisitions, we're moving into a new phase where computers are becoming as essential to education as plumbing, electricity, roofs, and walls. We cannot live without them, and unfortunately, unlike buildings, computers have a relatively short lifespan. Right now, um, we started out five years ago with some assisted technology work with iPads predominantly, and we found very good effect with working with um, children on the autism spectrum, um, children with um, uh, reading and other types of disabilities, and also the assistive technology allows a student to participate in a classroom at a level of curriculum that's more suited to their needs, so they can be part of the curriculum of the class, but use the assistive technology to, to help them keep up with the class in general for those students that are integrated. 90% of this um, adaptive technology that we've been using in special education is five years or older. So we, you know, part of this year request is going to be to replace these cycles of machines that we found to be very helpful. Also devices at the middle school and the high school are old. Um, new wireless technology doesn't have much mercy on an old machine. It's very difficult to keep kids up to date with what they need to know in terms of the technology if their machines are obsolete. Um, digital skills is becoming essential to all aspects of education. Uh, English language learners are going to be tested on computers. And as we know, <coughs> MCAS is being phased out to be replaced by a player to be named later that will inevitably be on a computer. Um, so it's very important that our students, not only to develop 21st century skills to be productive citizens, but also to do the educational needs of today, really need the equipment they need. So it's not a one year or a two year or a three year thing, it's going to be an every year thing from now on. And, and that's expensive, but it is the reality. Um, one of the other aspects of this year's um, increase is going to be to allow us to balance access to technology across our elementary schools. As you know, our elementary population is growing significantly. And last year, we had sufficient um, devices so that there was at least a, an iPad cart for each elementary grade. Now, in a school with two or three classrooms, that's great. But in a school with four classrooms, that's not so great. So we would really like to balance it to the point where we have a cart for every two classrooms, rather than trying to share one cart over three or four classrooms. Um, and also, as you know, Thompson, when we opened it, thanks to partially through the funding of the MSBA, is a one-to-one -one school, so that every student in the Thompson school has access to a, a device all day long. But starting in 17, they're going to start to be three years old, and iPads have a useful lifespan of three years. Um, and I can really vouch for that, because my iPad is about to be three years old this summer, and it's already getting flaky. So um, it's very sad. And I take good care of it, but I do use it every day, and the touches are starting to go. The number here is $400,000. That's what we're asking for for the computers for this year. This but, I, but the important thing to bear in mind is that this isn't going to be a one-time ask. And now the good news, the Stratton School Initiative. <coughs> Over the summer, we completed a, <coughs> we completed a feasibility study where we involved community, education, teachers, to really work to develop a definition of what would bring the Stratton School to parity with the other schools in the district, recognizing that the MSBA does not accept that the Stratton School is in dire enough shape to warrant a major project funding. So we're going to have to do it on our own. The Stratton School was partially renovated, which many of you may remember. The um, classroom wing had new windows, a new boiler, new roofs, new univents in the classrooms to really improve the energy efficiency and the comfort of those classrooms. At the time, we really confined our efforts to that wing of the building because we weren't sure what we were going to do with the other wing of the building. Now the decision has been made that the, the other wing of the building will be preserved, but it too needs roof, window, boilers. But there's also things that need to be done to the Stratton to make it comparable to the other schools. Presently, their, their library media center is extremely undersized for a modern school, and it has two instead of one smallish but not extremely small gymnasiums. And so as part of the feasibility study, what we're planning to do is restructure, sp oh, it also doesn't have a kitchen um, when it serves lunch. The students are served their lunch in the hallway, 
and there's like a warming closet where the food gets heated up. Um, when I went to school, um, I won't tell you when, uh, my hot lunch was served out of carts like that in the hallways as well because the school didn't have a cafeteria. So it's, it was kind of nostalgic the first time I saw it, but it's really time to update that. So what we're going to be doing on that uh, administrative wing is reconfiguring, taking out where the old media center was, building a serving kitchen, um, building a significant office space, improving the nurse's station, um, improving that whole section. And then we're going to be converting the smaller of the two gymnasiums to a new library media center that will be really nice. It'll have a lift in it to make it accessible and it will allow you know it, it to really be a showcase library media center for the district. The people that worked on the committee and the Stratton community a whole, as a whole who have seen this feasibility um, proposal are very excited about it and um, the capital budget committee has done some wonderful work to make this possible um, and so we hope we'll have your support to begin the architectural drawings um, with this cycle and the project itself in the next budget cycle we'd like to start as soon as the kids walk out the door in June of 16 to run the contractors in right behind them and finish up in a 14 month project so that they'll be going in in the following fall in order to do that however given the general state of um, population we have at the elementary schools now and that the Stratton historically has been the least populated of all our buildings we're going to have to relocate, relocate these kids out of the Stratton for the duration of the, the construction project. And we are proposing as part of what's in the capital plan to put modulars at several different sites around the district to house the students um, while the school is under construction. One of the sets of the modulars that we're planning to put in will be at the Audison, who is also experiencing great enrollment pressure. And those modulars we're planning to make permanent that they will go in and stay in. The fourth and fifth graders will, from the Stratton, will be there for one year, and then those classrooms will be incorporated into the Audison as a whole to help with their space pressures. The other two sets of modulars will be temporary and will come out once the Stratton is re-inhabited. Did I cover it? You did. Thank okay. you very much, Dan. Okay. Dean. As a, and no one out there, but as a, as a quick comment on the Stratton, having <coughs> sat who's on this committee, I think almost 10 years ago, I, I would say, you know, to everyone on the capital planning committee, thank you for your um, long-term perseverance for this project. For anybody that doesn't remember the history, we, we were going to redo all the schools, and this one got stopped um, with the Thompson. And I, I remember sitting through the initial capital planning meeting. I think when we were sort of stuck in the mud, and I sat here, and Charlie sat over there, and I sort of talked about fiscal and economic reality, and Charlie rejected that out of hand and said, "No, we're going to." do both schools, then we got to the process of putting $500,000 in the capital budget for both, the Thompson and the Stratton, and we talked about movable assets and stuff like that. And um, I mean, this really is a project that's come a long way, and really a lot of perseverance in people who could have given up on it fairly Back into the total estimated project costs. Um, so on the forefront, um, in the FY16 capital budget, uh, we've included uh, $1,085,000 for uh, design and OPM services, owner's project uh, manager. Um, the bids are due today for the OPM. Uh, we'll assemble the design and selection committee, uh, and then the ball will officially be rolling. Um, in <coughs> FY17, uh, we have $5.7 million um, <coughs> uh, programmed uh, for construction and student uh, relocation, and this is the portion of the project, or one of the portions of the project that will be funded in the non-exempt plan. In addition, uh, as Diane had mentioned, uh, we have half a million dollars programmed in 17. Uh, for uh, modulars at the Audison, which will be used in the interim uh, for Stratton relocation and then uh, permanently um, for uh, Audison students. Uh, and then the last two components are uh, the Capital Planning Committee uh, is recommending using $4 million from uh, the 2000 uh, debt exclusion. Um, if you look at the vote, uh, the Stratton was listed there and those funds are available to used. And then lastly, uh, we're recommending to use $750,000 uh, from a sale of a town asset. Uh, we were here last Wednesday, um, and the town manager walked you through the plan for the DAV, uh, and it's assumed that uh, the town asset that is uh, most likely to be liquidated by the time this project, or in time to have an impact on this project, would be the DAV. So uh, put all those together, 
Uh, and we have a total uh, estimated project cost of uh, just over 12 million. So just um, <coughs> the, the um, in, in summary, that there's exempt exempt funds, non-exempt capital budget, sale of town assets. That's where we and this is similar similar to what we did with uh, with the Thompson School. Um, the next subject is the rescinding prior debt authorizations and. Uh, we're not going to ask you to vote on this tonight. We thought we were. Uh, the the uh, deputy town manager and the treasurer and the comptroller are still working on ironing uh, s these funds out. I expect that we will have a final sheet for you uh, within the next uh, <coughs> week to ten days, and, and we should be able to uh, come up with a, a vote on it. You're a little shorter than that. Um, we can do your first meeting next week. Monday, sir. Are you meeting on Monday? Well, uh you know, we've been, uh, our last meeting is the 30th, for all intents and purposes. I don't want to put off anything beyond there, but uh, uh, 25th? Yeah, I was, I was saying even early is this next Monday, so a week from today. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <coughs> okay, so uh, this, is, this is where we started out, but there's, there's still some issues there. Um, okay, so I, I guess I'm going to, since we're short on time, I'm going to pass on the uh, big issues to ponder. You can re read that for yourself. Uh, and then page 38 is, is the summary of the five-year plan and the FinCom guidelines. Just to reemphasize again that um, we are meeting the 5% budget uh, both this year and over the course of the five-year plan. You have uh, got your attachments, the capital budget, the five-year capital plan, the forecast of the new debt service. And on page 40 is, is the, this is an, uh, an outline that we give you uh, every year. And this, on the left-hand side, you see what we're asking you to vote uh, for the uh, capital, capital budget. And then uh, all of the votes, including for both non-exempt and exempt debt services, are shown on the, on the right. And the total tax rate appropriation at the end of the day is $10,231,101. Now, uh, as in the past, before um, the, the Finance Committee's budget book gets together, these numbers will be spread out in the standard form, uh, listing all of the items that are in the spreadsheets that have been attached here and um, prepared in, in the formal way that we voted at town meeting. But what <coughs> this uh, page 40 uh, discloses to you all of the cost uh, elements of that vote, and we're asking for your support on that. So. Uh, in summary, what we're asking for tonight is uh, your favorable action on the uh, recommended capital budget for fiscal year 16, um, the support for our five-year plan going through fiscal year 20, support for the Stratton funding plan, the transfer of $10,000 from the perpetual care to the capital budget for maintenance of uh, grave zones, and we're holding off on the support for the debt research <coughs> because it's, it's not complete. Um, thank you for spending this time to listen to this lengthy presentation. We'll try to make it quicker next year. There's an awful lot in here. So you did well. Uh, are there any questions? For other questions for the Capital Budget Committee? Okay. I'd like to thank you all and part of the Finance Committee. You've done tremendous work. These people start sometime in September, if I remember correctly. And uh, it's an awful lot of work to do, and we thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the major uh, vote, I'd like to take a couple votes tonight. Uh, is on the recommended vote on page uh, 40. page 40 of your presentation. Uh, most of you have been through this before. Uh, okay. uh, most of you have been through this cycle before. Uh, are there any questions? Is there a motion? Wait a minute. Uh, Jonathan? Being asked to vote the uh, capital expenditure budget or the tax rate appropriation. Basically, you're being asked to vote this, the whole thing. Now, when it actually 
uh, I will be haranguing Charlie to, to get the whole vote out because the vote takes about three, two to three pages. Uh, but you're basically being asked to vote on this uh, spreadsheet. And that will include uh, a tax rate appropriation of the uh, 10,231,101, but, but basically as printed there. Bill? Is the bond amount a bond premium of a, a future bond offering or? Uh, I think that's a past, that's a past premium. Past premium. Uh, that's the premium from the fall 2014 bond issue, I believe. Is that correct, Charlie? That's correct. Okay. So that, that's a solid number. Is there any other questions? Okay. Do I have a motion? Moved. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion on Article 24? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, so unanimous vote. Thank you. Okay, and thank you. Thank you. Now, Charlie, the um, the rescission vote would be substantially in this form, but there's just a few things they need to iron out. It would be substantially in this form. The biggest amount is, is, the, uh, is the Thompson School, and I can explain that. Um, it's eighteen million dollars, I believe. Um, I'm sorry, twelve, 12 million dollars for Thompson School. Yep. And there's a couple of other things associated with that. When we when we uh, accepted money from the state from the Thompson School, the, the total project was about twenty million dollars. And the state was paying 49% uh, or something like that. But they made the town take, uh, authorize the full bond for the full amount on, on the grounds that if for whatever reason the state changed its mind and didn't give us the money, the town could raise the taxes to pay the, pay the debt service and go forward with the project. So as a result, since the MSBA paid for half of the school essentially in real time as it was taking place, that that authorization doesn't have to be used as excess authorization. And then you've got additional money from the sale of the uh, Crosby? The sale of Crosby. And a few and other? From the non-exempt capital plan and so forth. Okay. Uh, is there any other questions on this? Okay, so hopefully this will be essentially, uh, it'll be uh, what's put in there. And uh, when we get the final vote, we can probably take it fairly quickly. Now, the, the other vote, uh, and so Article 25 is pending. Article 42. Uh, Article 42 is the uh, money we're taking. <coughs> my voice is gone. Uh, from uh, the sale of lots and graves from perpetual care. Uh, we need to appropriate 150, uh, transfer $150,000 to the cemetery commissioners for the care of town cemeteries and $10,000 to the capital budget for headstone cleaning and repair. Uh, and then uh, I get to talk to Ruth about any preference between perpetual care and sale of lots and graves. There's plenty of money. Perpetual care is like almost $6 million, and the sale of lots and graves is about 240000 So we could take it out of re reach, but unless you have a particular preference. I like uh, only that she'll tell you that there's some, uh, some things, money can be found, some things from one fund and not from the other. So right. But I move that. Okay, uh, so that's what it is. A uh, motion to uh, support those two amounts. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any questions? Okay, all those in favor of transferring $150,000 uh, to cemetery commissioners and $10,000 to the capital budget out of those two funds, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Favorable action, unanimous. Okay, now on the, a couple of other things. Um, I'm trying to sort of set this up you know, to, to get the report out and get everything done. Um, I talked to Marie in the selectman's office. They're going to mail it out on their selectman and the redevelopment board on, on April 17th. So 
my problem, if we meet on the 13th, wrap up anything. I don't think it'll need to be a full meeting, but we'll wrap it up. And then on the 15th, though, we don't, we have to wait to the 15th to get the House Ways and Means Committee budget. And you remember from a couple of nights ago, uh, there's more, the governor had recommended more money than we had originally planned, which means we can increase the amount of money going into the fiscal stability fund. Now, of course, whether the House and Senate uh, go along with that, we just don't know. We usually go with the House Ways and Means Committee numbers. It's the most recent, um, and then adjust it that way. But if I wait to the 15th, we're just not going to get the report done on time. So if the, if the Finance Committee will give me the authority to adjust the Fiscal Stability Fund from what we voted, either up if we get more money or down if we get less money from the report on the 15th, then we could meet on the 13th, I could make those adjustments and we could get to print. So, so moved. Second. Second. Okay. Any discuss any questions about what I'd like to do? I have one question. Sure. Are you gonna in the in the long range plan are you changing any of the top numbers? Uh, the, the revenue numbers? Um well the, the, the state aid would would go up. Um you know, if the state aid goes up or goes down, or if the state aid goes up from the governor's numbers, uh, that number would go up. So the total revenues would go up, and the total fiscal stability fund would go up to balance it out. So, okay, so the only comment I wanted to make is when we go into the town meeting, we try to make the five year plan that's in the capital report be the same five year plan that's in the, in the finance committee report. So that we may adjust the top line of the five-year plan. The, uh, we're not going to change any of the items in the budget, but the the, uh, the top line, and then consequently the the percentage that we're within the five percent might might change as a result. Okay, so if the, if the if the revenues go up, your five percent probably goes goes down. Down, down. yeah, something like that. Okay, just, not gonna, just commenting that. Uh, if we go in there with two different plans, we're going to get questions from people at town meeting. You know, why is this? Why okay. is that? So if we can, you know, we can both adjust our things a little bit uh, on that Wednesday, yeah. and then Alan, you know, and Gloria, we need to get everything so it goes to print there. If it doesn't work out, you know, I'm not going to. I've never been able to get it into the thing that goes out to the uh, uh, town meeting members with the selectmen and redevelopment board. But I thought I'd like to try uh, if we could. Otherwise. We'll send it out by email uh, to all the town meeting members and put it on the seats the first night. So we'll try to do it. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Did we vote it? Did we vote it? I'm we vote sorry. It? Oh, we didn't vote on it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Unanimous. Favorable action. Okay. Uh, conflict of interest. Out of the 22 people that have to take it, only 12 people have done it and turned in their forms. So 10 people, and I won't name names, but you know who they are, uh, still need to do that by like, I don't know, I think it's April 6th or something. Uh, so next time I start reading names. Okay, capital plans done, those votes are done. Okay, solar. Um, I, I think in the last session, trying to wrap up everything and get an awful lot done uh, in, in the last session from the town manager. Um, this got a bit shortchanged, and I apologize for that. I think that um, this is something the manager's been working on and negotiating uh, since last fall. Um, it, it needs more discussion. I, I think he'd, have to like, he'd like to have a vote of support. Um, but I think we need to have more discussion. So a couple people on the committee have also already done a great deal of work um, uh, looking at the contract, which is 82 pages. Um, and so what I'd like to do is schedule the 25th um, for a discussion on the solar contract. So that's you know about a week and a half away. Um, and whether you want to take a vote uh, of support or not take a vote, that's, that's up to you. Um, I think you heard uh, some of the um, concerns uh, that have been mentioned by several people. Um, those, those concerns and a lot of the discussion have been forwarded to the manager. The manager is working on sort of a Q&A 
uh, to go through all the questions and answers um, and concerns that people have raised. So what I ask you to do is to read through the memo um, that is uh, uh, that came from the manager. Uh, give it some thought. If any of the attorneys on the committee would like to actually read the entire plan, um, if they could email, put this on you, Charlie. If they emailed you, Charlie, can you email them the? Uh, yeah, actually, I'll give you a link because the uh, it's 19 megabytes, and half the time it doesn't go through the email system. Okay. Now, uh, so call Charlie and he'll email you the link and, and you could read through 82 pages. Um, I think there are some, uh, some, some reasonable concerns. Uh, I think we all need to give it some thought. The manager has promised uh, to get a whole more explanation back uh, by Friday or at the latest Monday morning on a lot of these concerns and questions. And uh, so you have a chance to, you know, to read through them and then we could have a full discussion on the uh, on the 25th. Um, Al? Yes, Jonathan. Will, will the town manager be joining us? On yes, the, the manager will be here uh, to try to answer any, any of your questions. And uh, I know he was able to answer some of my concerns in a, uh, in a discussion, but you know, it's, it's a big issue. It's a, it's a 20 year deal. So uh, we need to give it more thought. Uh, so the 25th, maybe you can put write that in on the uh, posting. Um, I'm, sure. I'm going to send the link to Gloria, and then she can distribute it to the whole committee, and anybody who wants to download the contract can. Okay. Then why Great. don't we just do that? So um, you send it to Gloria. Gloria, you send it out to everybody. And uh, there's also some uh, spreadsheets in there that have been put together. Sloppily, I don't want to claim ownership. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion on this in the uh, newspapers. Um, I, I think you, you can't swing a dead snake without hitting a house with solar panels on it in this town. Uh, so, so it's obviously a big topic and I want to give it full discussion. In line with that, um, if we could have on this Wednesday as many of the remaining budgets as possible, um, I think, Christine, you said the uh, facility budget you'll, be, you'll have for Wednesday? Uh, we can do it tonight. I, I, the present, they made the presentation. I, I recommend that the uh, budget be approved as printed in, the, in our budget book. Okay. Second. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> does everybody have any other questions on the facilities budget? No, I'll second that, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't get us out of here. Okay. All those in favor of the facility budget as printed, we say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, done. Okay, there's treasurer's budgets. I think there's assessor's budgets. If we could, and there's the water and sewer budget. And health insurance. Um, and, and health insurance, right. Health That's health a big insurance. one. We're, do, we're doing health insurance and assessor tomorrow on Wednesday morning. So for Wednesday night, we can. Okay, let's see if we can make this. Now, we have a discussion on the master plan. So, you know, I've asked you to read through that. Let, let's say maybe. 15 minutes to a half hour to discuss it and then we either let the selectmen's motions hang and we just let them do it or we can take a position to support or whatever else you want to do uh, so we'll start off with the uh, discussion on the master plan we'll go into the budgets and we'll just run them uh, the school committee comes on Monday uh, that usually pretty much takes the whole evening uh, and then the uh, 25th, we'll have the discussion on the solar. Any other budgets? Uh, the 30th is sort of a reserve. Um, and then the 13th, uh, we'll get the collective bargaining uh, and hopefully tie everything together, and that'll be it. Is there any questions nope. on direction or anything? Any injury? Mm -hmm.